welcome brothers and sisters to First Presbyterian Church of Mount Vernon. It's my absolute pleasure to be in front of you. My name is Etta Graham Mitchell and may God continue to bless each and every one of you as we go into worship. Now hear the call to worship. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make God's way clear. Lift up every valley, lower every mountain, for the glory of the Lord shall reveal. anyone to perish, but rather for all to come to repentance. Therefore, let us confess our sins, for God's salvation is at hand. The Prayer of Confession Faithful God, we confess that we have not led lives of holiness. We suffer from impatience, apathy, and greed. We have not been at peace. We repent of these offenses and turn to you in love. Forgive our iniquity and pardon our sins that we may walk in righteousness to the glory of your name. Amen. We'll now have a moment of silent contemplation. Now hear the assurance of pardon. Brothers and sisters, by the mercy of Christ, your sins are forgiven. For salvation is at hand for all who turn to God. Now I know we're not all closely sitting together, but God asks that we pass the peace because the peace begin in our hearts. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. To this peace we were called as members of a single body. May the peace of Christ be with each of you. Brothers and sisters, at this time, I just want to, to invite you to a Zoom coffee hour that we are planning for Saturday, December 12th 
from 6 to 7 p.m. We invite you to join us and we will be, you will be getting more information through the mail and by email. Thank you so much. Now, hear the prayers of the people. Gracious God, we come to bring you, we come to bring to you during this season of Advent, we are so full of hope, peace, joy, and love. Merciful God, we give thanks to you that we can come to you in all season. And what a good God you are that you make space for us despite who we are. We love you and adore you. May the power of Jesus be born in us again. And we pray for strength for those who are weak. We pray for those who have grown weary during this pandemic. Renew within us the vision and excitement of our lives, which are motivated, which are filled of peace and a sense of purpose. You come, gentle Jesus, to a world of broken hope, of broken people. Come again to us and transform us as you did those who experienced your touch and your grace. We pray for those who need your special touch, touch, those who are sick, those who are lonely, those who are mourning, those who are depressed, those who are not seeing your light, those who are losing their faith, and we pray for those who are homeless, who are jobless. We pray for those who are incarcerated, especially those who are incarcerated within their own minds. Oh, merciful God, we know that you are a God that is able to do the things that we think are impossible. And so we give special prayer for those who are outside of Christ. We pray also for our world a world that is so full of confusion. They're in constant strife, not just rumors of war, but war, filled with passions and rage and uncertainty. This world needs your compassionate embrace. Make us more teachable. Make us hungry and thirsty for your word and the word. Make us more open to hear our neighbors and love them despite our differences. We pray for our government officials we pray for them to understand who the true leader is. Most of all, God, we know that ah, there are so many things that are going on, Father. And we know that you are the one that you look down and you look high. We're in between and we need you. We need you to comfort us. We need you to squelch those feelings when we begin to doubt if you are there. We know you're there because you have told us that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And so we come in this morning, at this hour, in this second Sunday of Advent to lift up holy voice to you, to lift up holy ears to you, to not just hear the words that you have given us in your scriptures, but to do something, Father God, to believe in who you are, to believe that despite what we are seeing right now, because of the faith that you have stilled in us through the Holy Spirit, we know that joy will come in the morning. But right now, this, this that we're going through is something that we have to go through. And we ask that you change us, that you remold us, that you make us sprinkling new, newness, transformation. Oh, Father God, how we love you. How we just give our very self to you, Father God. We know that there might be someone right now who is just wanting to hear that extra word from you, wanting to say, it was good that I got up this morning. And we thank you that you woke us up, that you woke us up and we are in our right minds, that we could worship you and that we could be in full anticipation of the Holy Spirit, of God the Father and of Jesus Christ, his son, who you have sent to die for us so that we can have eternal life. Oh, how we love you and how we praise you when we were wondering and we just didn't know what to do, Father God, you called for it and you said, let there be, and it was. Your words are powerful. Your words never come back to you void. And so right now, Father God, when we were wondering and just didn't know what to do, one of your disciples reach out and say, teach us how to pray. 
and you brought them this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Offertory Invitation The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. May your righteousness go before God and prepare a pathway for the Lord. Let us offer our lives and labor to God and fulfill our vows to the Most High. At this time, we encourage you to support our church with your offering and your tithes by mail, by PayPal, or you can drop it off in person at the church office. Thank you. The Prayer of Dedication Lord, we give you thanks that in the coming of Christ, your steadfast love and faithfulness have met and your righteousness and peace have kissed. May the gifts we offer this day lift, lift up those in need and prepare the way of your salvation. Amen. The Prayer for Illumination Mighty God, send your Holy Spirit to speak peace that the good news of this age may be proclaimed through your word, which stands forever. Amen. The scripture readings this morning will be taken from Psalm 85, verse 1 to 2, and verse 8 to 13. The second lesson will be from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 15a. Fourth reading will be from Mark chapter 1, verse 1 through 8. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sins. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely he, he is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. So that they should set their hope in and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and he will make a path for his steps. The second lesson is from 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 8 to 15a. But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away, pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of person ought you to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved, and the elements will, will melt with fire? But in accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth, where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace, without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. 
Now, hear the gospel lesson taken from Mark 1, verses 1 through 8. The proclamation of John the Baptist. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appear in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camels here, with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I, ba I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the good news. Brothers and sisters, friends, beloved, we're here yet one more time to celebrate Advent, not taking it for granted, not making it as if it's just another day and yet another season as we prepare for the birth of our son, Jesus the Christ. This is a special time for us as believers because we come together, we gather to just worship the one and only God, to just give praise to him. I, Before I go into the sermon, I offer a prayer. Most Heavenly Father, just touch my tongue cover me wrap me in your arms move me out of the way let it not be my words but words that are coming from you that your people will hear if there's any in anything in me that needs to be removed any distraction remove it so that the people can hear you oh god thank you thank you for seeing me, me, touching me, that I'm able to be here to deliver your word. I don't take it lightly. I love you. I praise your holy name. In Jesus the Christ, amen. I've entitled this sermon, Is It Good News to You? So when we hear the word news, many of us don't usually, many of us usually don't think good news first because it's almost like we're trained to hear only the bad news. Good news is often not announced. What we usually hear is that good news doesn't sell. It's as if we're hardwired to only gravitate to bad news. The better the, the better it is, the more we tune into it. Some of us don't even want to hear the good news coming from our friends, especially if we don't have our own good news. Let's be real. Sometimes mental health professionals even have to remind people to decrease the amount of time that they spend listening, watching in the news because of the negative effect that it can have on one's psyche. I'm not saying that we don't need the news, but I, for one, especially during this pandemic, had to try to filter out what news I was going to be tuning into. Due to how this year 2020 has been going, we are all yearning to hear some good news. The book of Mark is one of the synoptic gospel in the New Testament. It is said by Bible scholars to have been written between 65 and 72 CE. While this gospel appears second in the four gospels, it was noted to have been written first. 
The writer wanted everyone to know that Jesus was God's son and that he is the Messiah. We see from the onset of this story, Mark wanted everyone to know how important Jesus is. One of the tension in this gospel is that while others were saying who Jesus is, you know I said who Jesus is, not was. Because Hebrew 13.8 reminds us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus was telling er different folks, including demons, to not tell anyone who he is. In Mark 3, 11, 12, though, whenever the clean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and shouted, You are the Son of God! But he sternly ordered them not to make him known. In Mark 8, 30, and he sternly ordered them, his disciples, not to tell anyone about him. After Peter declared him to be the Messiah, some say he was doing this because his real mission had not been fully known or understood at the time of his early miracles. Jesus knew that his mission was to suffer and die on the cross to redeem, humanity, to redeem humanity. But even when he told his disciples, they didn't understand what he was saying. But dying and suffering, this is not the Messiah that those under oppression were expecting. The people were waiting for a warrior king, not one who came to die. They wanted a Messiah who came to fight, not to suffer and die. So the question is, what is the beginning of the good news and good for whom? It is not enough to announce good news in order for it to be good news. Those who are hearing it must believe that it's good for them. When we hear good news as believers, we put our faith and trust in the subject of the good news, Jesus the Christ. During times of sadness, pandemic, loneliness, we all need to hear good news. And this manner, and this manner, we're equally connected to those who were under their under oppression by the Romans way back when. The disciples were warned that suffering would be their plight. And we see in Mark 10 45 that Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. This is easy for us to read these words, but just imagine how difficult it must have been to hear that following the Messiah meant that it would, it would involve suffering. Not only that you would suffer, but he would be suffering too. This is what his early followers were hearing. Could it be why they just couldn't understand what they were hearing? What do you mean if we follow you, we have to suffer and die. Don't we as believers ponder as well who Jesus is to us? As believers, we can become very forgetful, forgetting that once we were outside of Christ, and it's because of Christ's actions that we have been redeemed. It isn't anything that we have done. Are you okay having accepted his call? Do you feel good, sad, are you full of faith or full of doubt? Are you like the father in Mark 9, 24, who says, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. This interplay between belief and unbelief is extremely important because this is what God is requiring from us, our belief in Jesus Christ. These gospel writers are said to be eyewitnesses as they tell the story of Jesus Christ. If we believe the scholars, here is the first story, and we give thanks for the other gospel writers because between them, we will learn more about Jesus. Here we see Mark, but who is Mark? His full name was said to have been John Mark, taken from Acts 12.12, 12, and he was a cousin of Barnabas, Colossians 4.10. Remember, he was traveling with Paul and Barnabas, but he turned back, Acts 13.13. 13. 
This action caused a rift between Mark and Paul, but they later reconciled. This gospel is being written during a time of war, and there was resistance because the people of Judea and Galilee were tired of the oppression that they were experiencing from the Romans. The temple was destroyed, and the Jewish believers were under stress and needed to hear some good news. Don't we want to hear some good news? And is it good to you? It is important to note that during the time of this writing, the other Gospels had not been written as yet. Mark's style of storytelling is to get right down to what he wanted his audience to know. Mark wanted us to know that Jesus is the one God. Jesus is the one God has chosen to rule over Israel. And thanks be to Jesus that by his obedience, we have been adopted into the family of God. There seems to be a sense of urgency in his writing. For instance, it is to be noticed that of the 59 times that the word immediately was used in the New Testament, 42 times they came out of Mark gospel. Mark's style of writing is depicting Jesus being on the move and also showing Jesus performing many miracles, including, of course, the most powerful miracle of Jesus, which is his suffering and his death. We see Jesus being quite busy, teaching the people, healing the people, curing the people of evil spirit, feeding the people, choosing his disciples, preaching to the people. It was as if Mark wanted to get the story out so that the people could learn about Jesus and embrace him. Mark 1, 1 reads, the beginning of the good news some virgins state the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So we see in this very first sentence, Mark started off by calling our attention to Jesus Christ and letting us know that Jesus was the Son of God. We're not being given any birth narrative or any gene genealogy of Jesus, as we see in the other gospel. In Mark's gospel, Jesus is all growing up and ready to begin what his father had sent him to do. In Luke 4.43, Jesus said this. He said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities. Also, for I was sent for this purpose. The first thing I thought about when I read this verse is what is the good news I found the answer to my question in the epistle that was written to the Corinthians by the Apostle Paul. This is our foundation as faithful believer. Hear this. In the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 4. Now, I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news or the gospel that I proclaim to you, which you in turn receive in which you also stand, through which you also are being saved. If you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you that as of first importance, what I in turn have received. Listen, that Christ died for our sin, in accordance with the scripture and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture. So what the gospel is, which the good news is, and who is bringing this to our attention? Paul. Paul is saying that the good news is that we are saved because of what Christ did. And what did Christ do? He died for us and he died so that we could live, he was buried, and on the third day, he rose in accordance with the scriptures. That's the good news. That's what we believe in. All of what's written in the Bible is to bring us to this point, to know that Christ died for us, Christ was raised, and on the third day, 
we have a living Christ. In Isaiah 53, 4, 5 says, Surely he was born, he has borne our infirmities, carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgression, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruise we are healed. Do you understand what this gospel is? What Christ had to go to? Christ who knew what his purpose was, was to come into this world, take on our sin debt, and die so that we can have eternal life. I know some of us give Paul a bad name, but he was very important in sharing what is the good news with us because we see in Mark 8, 27 through 29, 29 Jesus went on with his disciple to the villages of Caesarea, Philippi, and on his way, he asked his disciples, who do people say I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. Jesus wasn't satisfied with that answer. So he asked again, but who do you say I am? Jesus, but Peter answered for himself and the group, you are the Messiah. In Hebrew, the word Messiah means anointed one. And in Greek, Christos which of course we get the word Christ. So when we say Jesus the Christ, rather than just Jesus Christ, we're accurately stating who he is. Christ is not his surname, but who he is, the Messiah, the anointed one. This is good news. Is it good news to you? We see Peter proclaim that Jesus was the Messiah but he didn't say anything further because he didn't know about the resurrection. After Peter's claim, Jesus stated that suffering, rejection, and death was in store for him. Peter could not accept this because he didn't like, he didn't sound like good news. Peter nor the other disciples didn't quite understand who Jesus is. So we need to thank our brother Paul because he brought the gospel. He, he's telling us what the gospel is. That Christ came and died, crucified, buried, and on the third day was risen. Our biblical brother, the Apostle Paul, gave us this message that we are to proclaim that we are saved because Christ died for our sins, was buried, and was raised. That is the good news. As faithful believers, this is what we must believe. This is what we do believe. This is the gospel, not a gospel, the gospel. Jesus is proclaiming the good news, but it is good, but is it good news to you? You see, when Jesus was bringing the good news, the people who he was telling it didn't quite understand it. So just as Paul introduces us to the gospel, we see Mark introducing us to John, the, the baptizer, through the prophet Isaiah. Verse 3, the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. We see John, John was a different kind of preacher. He came out of the wilderness preaching a repentance message. People need to turn away from their sins and ask for forgiveness and be baptized. John was God's messenger, sent to prepare the way of the Lord. John came out of the wilderness to preach repentance and to help prepare for the coming of the one that even he, John, will bow to, bow down to, and praise. We see everything about John was different right down to the way he dressed and what he ate. Mark, who is not a man of details in this case, took time to share this detail because I believe he wanted to show that John was not part of the establishment. He wasn't a Pharisee, a Sadducee. 
He was sent by God to introduce God's son. John became so popular that even Jesus' disciples were worried that he was more popular than Jesus. But John didn't get caught up in that. John was focused and he knew his mission was to introduce Jesus to everyone. John knew his mission was to prepare the way for Jesus. The connection between John and Jesus is one that we should pay attention to, especially opening our understanding to the meeting in the wilderness. We normally don't think of the wilderness as a place where good things are happening. But remember, God recognized his beloved son in the wilderness right after his baptism. The wilderness can be a place to reset our agenda and to take time to cry out to God. We could actually say during this pandemic time, aren't we in a sense of wilderness? Aren't we just kind of having like a, a big old pause, waiting to see what next, what will come? So in some regard, we are in a wilderness state. But I declare to you, brothers and sisters, my beloved, that in this wilderness state that we are in, don't let it be a dry season. Wet yourself with God. Cover yourself with God. Feast on what God has done for you and me. Think about how he loved us so much that during all the evilness that he saw going on, he sent his son, Jesus the Christ, to die for us. If we were to think back and go back into the first testament, when God saw how the world was, what did he do at that time? He sent a flood to wash out everything. And he had eight people left to repopulate his earth. Don't tell me that Jesus is not a God who looks at the impossible and see the possibility of things. So while we're here in our wilderness, wondering when this is going to be over, praying faithfully, anticipating the advent, anticipating 2021, and just praying to God that we can hear pandemic deaths being lower, we can hear our friends crying out saying they feel better. We can hear family members saying, I don't feel as bad as I did before. So in our wilderness, those who are faithful believers, we ought to be crying out to God. We ought to be praying on our knees and we better, better, better be doing something different than what we were doing before. So in our wilderness, don't think of it as a dry place, but think of it as God, what you want me to do? Here I am. The wilderness can be considered a place of divine salvation, a place of divine testing. Let God go ahead and test you. You recall right after Jesus' baptism, Satan tested him in the wilderness and he was victorious. John and Jesus was definitely pointing to God doing a new thing. Let this pandemic be our new thing that we don't, we come out of it even more faithfully grounded in the one and only Jesus Christ. A new thing. Could this be the beginning of the good news that Mark is making sure that we fully understand? John and Not announces that the people are to come and be baptized in the Jordan River so that their sins will be forgiven. The Jordan symbolizes a place of freedom, leaving behind the old and stepping into the new. You all know how the Israelites crossed through the Jordan. John announces Jesus as the one who is coming, who is even more powerful than him, and will be baptizing with the Holy Spirit. We all pray that the Holy Spirit just dwell in us, and we have made space for the Holy Spirit to be in us. Let the Holy Spirit convict us so as we try to go down the path of darkness, the Holy Spirit point us to the light is Jesus Christ. We see John announcing good news. He wanted the people to get ready for Jesus. In 2 Peter 
3, 9, 13 and 15. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But in accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth, where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while we're waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace, without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. See, here we are in our situation. Some of us might still have these moments of unforgiveness wrapped tightly around our hearts about what somebody did to you how many years ago, who didn't talk to you, who didn't call you during the pandemic, who didn't reach out, and we're walking around with those things stirring up in us. Those of us who are fortunate to have our jobs, we go to work and we wonder how this person got more masks and I didn't get enough, and we carry those burdens with us, not knowing that let those things go and just keep asking God each day, each morning to prepare your hearts, to open up your, your heart space so that he, the Holy Spirit, can just be there wrapping you in his arms. This is the good news, to know that Jesus is our peace. And on the second Sunday in Advent, as we call on the Prince of Peace, we pray for peace to come into our hearts. Ephesians 2.14a said, For he is our peace. He means Jesus Christ is our peace. We're reminded by the psalmist in Psalms 85, 8, 10, and 11. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. When I read that, I said how wonderful it is to be completely surrounded by the love and peace that is found in having faith in Jesus Christ. This is the good news. The Puritan Thomas Watson put it in this way. God, the son, is called the Prince of Peace. He came into the world with a song of peace, on earth peace. He went out of the world with a legacy of peace. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Christ's earnest prayer was for peace. He prayed that his people might be one. Christ not only prayed for peace, but bled for peace. For peace. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, he died not only to make peace between God and man, but between man and man. Christ suffered on the cross that he might cement Christians together with his blood as he prayed for peace, so he paid for peace. Thanks be to God. Most Heavenly Father, Almighty God, oh, how we thank you. We thank you for this world that you have created. We thank you that you bred life into us. Us. Oh, we are so not worthy of the love that you have shown us. We continue to ask that you guide us. Guide our mouth. Guide our feet. As we step into the new season. Let us step in doing something different, loving you more, loving the people that you put in our lives more. We just love you and we honor you. We pray for blessing on each and every one of us. Oh, we love you. Oh God, we give you our all. You are precious. You deserve all our attention. Thank you. Thank you. In the precious name of Jesus the Christ, amen. We celebrate the Eucharist. Christ our Lord invites to this table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace and with one another. Now as we begin our virtual um, celebration of the Eucharist, I'm going to give
give you all a few moments to get gather your elements. Please have your bread, crackers available, grape juice, or water. Then, when our table is set, we will begin. The table is set. Let us proceed. The words of invitation. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. People will come from north and south and from east and west to sit at table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Their eyes were then opened and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share the peace that has been prepared. We give you thanks that the Lord Jesus, on the night before he died, took bread and after giving thanks, broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant sealed by my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whoever drink of it do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Calling on the Holy Spirit, we pray that we may be made one with the risen Christ and with all God's people through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Let us break bread together on our knees. Let us break bread together. Let us pray. God in abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. 
Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us say together, Amen. 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 And now this concludes our service. Let us all look to the Lord. Lord God, we come thanking you once more again for all you are and all you do. Continue, oh God, to be with us as we go throughout the week. Bless each and every family, oh God. Bless each and every one. Keep us, oh God, forever in your care. Now may the grace of God, the love of our Lord and Savior Jesus to Christ and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit will rest you and abide with these your people now, henceforth and forevermore. Through Jesus Christ, our blessed Lord, let us all say together, Amen. The Apostles' Creed I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ his only Son, or Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered on a Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, hear the benediction. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God for your whole spirit and soul and body to be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus the Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 Brothers and sisters, let peace dwell in your hearts. Amen. Amen.